Good afternoon. Uh, I have really the truly great honor of introducing our um, distinguished investigator for the uh, for 2019, uh, Professor Seth Grant. Um, Seth was, did his early uh, medical studies at uh, University of Sydney in Australia. He kindly offered to uh, take out my appendix if I like, but I kindly suggested to him no. Um, <laughs> He did a postdoc with Douglas Hennan at Cold Spring Harbor after that, and then uh, another postdoc at Columbia with Eric Kandel. <clears throat> and then he came to the University of Edinburgh in uh, 1994, and he became a professor of molecular neuroscience. And then he uh, spent some time at the Wellcome Trust, and uh, also at, um, where, was, where was the other place you spent some time? Um, Melbourne, University of Melbourne. Um, <clears throat> And then he came back to Edinburgh and has been here since that time. Uh, he, I should mention also that he was a founding member of IBANG some 25 years ago. Um, that. so, <laughs> That's great. Right. Um, so uh, it, it, during the time when he was uh, working in, uh, with Kendall, they, uh, he and others were starting to dissect uh, um, molecular mechanisms of uh, learning and memory using the, the model of uh, long-term potentiation and uh, using, uh, in part, reverse genetic approaches. And some of that stuff uh, was just you know, really profound and had a huge impact, and still has a huge, huge impact on, the, on neuroscience in general. Uh, sometime after that, he started looking at, um, uh, more broadly, at uh, uh, postsynaptic, excitatory postsynaptic uh, terminals. And uh, uh, I sort of characterized the proteome of, of these terminals, and then carried on from there, and, Developed this idea of the synaptome and the synaptomic theory, which I think is what he's going to be uh, talking about today. Um, I do have a little bit of a sort of a personal, sort of personal connection uh, from across the sea, because uh, about the time when he was doing the work with Kandel, I was working at, as a postdoc at Gene Weiner's lab, and we were using forward genetic approaches to try and get at mechanisms of learning and memory as well. And, um, to, to be blunt about it, we didn't have nearly as much success as, as he and others did uh, using the reverse genetic approach. Um, so, uh, let's see, what else do I want to say here? Well, I guess that's pretty much it. Uh, oh, so he's, he's published, uh, no, I'm not done yet. I'm not done yet. I've got 40 minutes. <laughs> so a lot of his work has been published in really high profile journals. Science, multiple nature papers, nature neuroscience, nature genetics, cell neuron, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the work that he's been doing for the learning and memory stuff early on, all the way through the uh, the synaptome stuff more recently, has had a really profound impact on on neuroscience in general. Um, uh, so please join me in welcoming Professor Seth Grant. Thank you. pleasure to have this opportunity to come and give this talk to you today. And I'm going to try to pitch it at uh, a level at which it will help you understand, particularly if you're a student or a postdoc, about sorts of decisions and that you make at certain times in your career and also how to deal with the unexpected. And I'm pleased to say there were many unexpected moments um, in my research which have really very much changed the way I have had to think about some of the old problems. And in that context, I want to introduce you to this theme that was very well established as far back as the 19th century, which is the concept that there is a repertoire or set, excuse me, a repertoire or set of behaviors that all animals have. And indeed, it was in the 19th century that it was described that there was an architecture to that uh, repertoire in that there were simple reflexes which were thought to be building blocks for more complex instinctive behaviors, in turn building blocks for higher cognitive functions, and altogether these composed a whole variety of innate and learned behaviors, which in the case of the human have been described as being potentially infinite. And of course, what we want to know ultimately, I believe, is how is that organized and programmed at the level of the genome. Not only are there components of behavioral repertoire, but it's important to recognize that there is a temporal aspect to them, namely that behavioral components are deployed in sequences. For example, motor action 
in sequences, and even language where you understand the sequence of presentations of these phonemes. So here are some key problems that have yet to be solved at the level of the behavioral repertoire. And the first is, how is a vast, possibly unlimited number of representations <coughs> in the brain, and how can they be recalled almost instantaneously? How are temporal sequences of behavior stored and recalled? And how is the repertoire modified across the lifespan of the organism? And how do genetic disorders target <coughs> specific behaviors at specific ages? And finally, is there a general mechanism for generating and orchestrating behavioral diversity? Well, uh, in some people's minds, that has already been solved. And that is the theory, which is the connectionist theory, which was originally articulated by Cajal, and later by him, and in its molecular <coughs> instantiation later on by Kandel, which is namely that each perception, thought, action, behavior, is represented in a circuit of connected neurons, and that learning is simply the strengthening <coughs> of those connections. So with that sort of background, I wanted to uh, give you sort of a journey into it from the molecular side of things. But I was asked to give just a very bit, uh, a bit of autobiography. <coughs> and I would like to just tell you that I first started working on synaptic neurophysiology in the laboratory of David Reed at the University of Sydney, studying sleep and postnatal development, brainstem reflexes, and later with Stuart Clark for a short episode in London on respiratory uh, physiology. But after finishing my medical school, I went to work with Douglas Hanahan in 1985. And in that year, it was really a very key year for the explosion of transgenic technology. Doug published a marvelous paper showing gene uh, promoter-specific, tissue-specific expression of transgenes. It was a hugely exciting period of time. And during that time, I studied various sorts of transgenic mouse uh, studies in gene transfer. And at that time, there was a paper published by my people's group at Cold Spring Harbor in 1988, where they found that a gene was expressed at high levels in the hippocampus called the mass gene. And I went to Jim Watson, who was the director at the time, and I said, Jim, I'd like to uh, use this transgenic mouse technology to study the behavioral mechanisms of learning and look at this phenomenon known as LTP in the hippocampus. And Jim, in his typical way, he said, do it. And so he said, I also, there's one other thing I'd like to do, and I'd like to introduce you to one of the trustees of the lab, who was Eric Kandel. And shortly after that, Eric recruited me to his lab um, to work on actually a plisia. And Eric has, of course, done amazing and pioneering work from a top-down, using a top-down strategy and an understanding of biology of learning and memory. Top-down means you start with the behavior, you find the cells and circuits, and then you try to find out which molecules and so on are going on in there. And so when I went to Eric's lab, I did some work on gene transfer methods in a plaisir and published some papers where we're introducing genes into neurons and changing their their properties, but I really wanted to get back to work on mice and the mammalian um, nervous system. And this places the, the work in a context, and it's really quite remarkable to look back at this time, which is now 30 years ago. Here's a list of the proteins and genes that were known in the postsynaptic component of the excitatory synapse. And of course, there was some pharmacology that told us about certain transmitters, but there were very few molecules that had actually been characterized. There was a couple of uh, a structural protein and then up cat kinase 2 have been purified. And the first genes that were cloned of the synapse were in 1989, which is one of the ample receptor suburbs of Steve Hyman's lab. And there was certainly no genetics at that time. And the way we all thought that, that the postsynaptic terminal of excitatory synapses operated was remarkably simple. There was a receptor, an NMDA receptor, calcium would turn on an enzyme, cat kinase 2, which is the sporulating ample receptor. And it was thought this alone could respond for normal synaptic transmission, and these mechanisms here could account for the stable strengthening of LTP, and that's all there was to it, folks. And it was remarkable that such a simple device could operate this sort of few proteins. Now, I got into um, trying to tackle this problem and trying to think of what else might be doing something here, and at that time, oncogenes were making uh, major advances, and some of the key discoveries in oncogenes were that tyrosine kinases are critical elements in cell signaling. And as it turns out, the brain is the highest place where um, tyrosine kinases are expressed, which of course are post-mitotic. And I thought it would be very interesting and a no-brainer as a postdoc to study tyrosine kinases. 
And I teamed up with a physiologist who I still work with, Tom O'Dell, over here. And together I did the biochemistry and Tom did the physiology, which showed that tyrosine kinases were required for the potentiation, long-term potentiation um, of synapses. But I was constantly working on, on the mice, and in 1992, um, this was really a key year, uh, as Richard has just said, it was in that year that we published five uh, knockout mice in learning and memory, Alcino Silva, shown over here, um, published the Can Kinase 2 mice from the Susumu Tonegawa's lab, and in Eric's lab we published the Thin Sark, yes, and Abel Newton mice. And it was on the back of those sorts of projects that I first had a, my independent position here in Edinburgh. And this is where one has to make those super key strategic decisions, otherwise you're going to disappear as a postdoc into the, in, into the living. And so here was the strategy that I took. The first was to focus on postsynaptic molecular biology for three reasons. I could build on the previous work on tyrosine kinase signaling, and that the postsynaptic terminal is where information first arises. And I think this is a really a key strategic decision because if you're going to understand how information is processed in the nervous system, you should study it at the point at which it is first processed, which is at the point of the postsynaptic <coughs> terminal. And the third reason was work on areas which other people were not working on because the presynaptic terminal was crowded with some scientists who had become very famous for that work. The second key element of the approach was to do something different to the Candell approach, which was top down, which was to take a bottom up approach and fundamentally focus on biochemistry and genetics together because this is a proven way to understand biochemical mechanisms and fundamental mechanisms in many different organisms. It's a tried and tested universal approach. The second was to focus on multi-protein machines, as it was becoming clear that these perform fundamental biological processes, transcription factors, origin, origin of recognition complexes for DNA replication, and other kinds of molecular machines, the ribosome. And finally, to understand the molecules first was the strategy, and then see what they do um, in behavior. And this is one of the first experiments that I, I did. In fact, I had done some of these when I was still working in Eric's lab. And it was to take the protein associated with the NMDA receptor. In 1991, the first NMDA receptor subunit was cloned by Nakanishi's lab. I immediately started making antibodies to that. And using those antibodies, did an immunoprecipitation of the NMDA receptor under conditions that would preserve the physical association with other proteins. And then have a look at the proteins that came down using an antibody that would detect tyrosine phosphorylation, the substrates of thin. And you would see that there were several proteins there. Now, it was unknown what those proteins were, but Mary Kennedy at Craig Garner's lab, who had been working on proteins in the postsynaptic density, uh, had identified this abundant protein called PSD95, which when I did the same experiment with antibodies to that, I pulled down the same set of proteins, indicating that these were in some sort of physical complex. And so I immediately made this decision um, to make a PSD95 knockout mouse and to try to purify and understand these complexes in much greater detail. And that was in 1994. And Peter Seberg, who was a marvelous, whoops, a marvelous um, molecular biologist, had invited me to a symposium in Heidelberg. And Peter told me um, that they were about to publish this paper here where they used the yeast 2 hybrid method to show that the NMDA receptor binds through a PZ domain interaction with PSD95. Now, I panicked at that point because Peter's lab was a, an absolute machine for making knockouts. I mean, I was a, a starting um, person with one postdoc in my lab, and we were now starting to do this. And so I went back home and started to work very hard on that project. And I should point out, by the way, that this interaction that was shown by Peter and Morgan Cheney's lab turns out not to be uh, required in vivo. It took us another 20 years to actually make the mice with all the specific mutations so that the PDZ interaction is, in fact, not important for the assembly of those complexes. So then I saw over the next couple of years some surprises come up. And this was the first one. And this was our PSD95 knockout paper, uh, which was published in 1998. We had expected to see something along the lines of what we had seen in the fin mice that was less LTP and less learning. <coughs> However, we saw that there was a very much enhanced form of LTP. Here is the normal, here is enhanced. And there was an impairment of learning. So there was a dissociation, a genetic dissociation between and the second key observation was that there were, this was evidence that these complexes were involved with signaling. So this was really a key 
um, point in that time. I should also point out this little graph over here was neglected, which is to show that short term synaptic plasticity also changes. I'll come back to that. So that was in 1998. It was really, this was a turning point for me because I realized that it wasn't so straightforward, this relationship between LTP and learning. And many of the people here who may be aficionados of that will realize it's far from straightforward. And here was the next surprise, and this was came from our work on the purification. And I had a wonderful postdoc, uh, Paul Bavusi, a very good biochemist who really led uh, this work. And we purified using various sorts of methods, the NMDA receptor, with all of its associated proteins from the intact brain for the first time. And we found there were 10 times as many proteins associated that we or anybody else had thought. We found 77 of them. And these large complexes, which are about two megadaltons in size, and strikingly, 15 of the proteins are required for learning in mice and 22 for synaptic plasticity, indicating that those complexes must be extremely important for that, those key pieces of biology. And I think this was also a key discovery as well, is that we found that there were three human genetic disorders which encoded the proteins that were found in those complexes. Prior to that, those proteins, they were not known how they functioned um, in the nervous system. But this really required us to think differently because the role of the synapses in the simple connections model didn't require any of this molecular complexity. It also raised questions as to how much more complexity there remained to be discovered. And the 15 genes that were required for learning in mice, and the three in humans, suggested that these complexes could be very important for human diseases. And after all, what are those complexes really doing and how they're built? And finally, how did those complexes actually evolve? So we proceeded to characterize these complexes in more detail and using a whole variety of affinity methods and different approaches over the subsequent years. We, <coughs> we doubled or even tripled the number of proteins associated. And one of the very nice genetic methods which was developed by the Guru Kamiyama in my group was to find a way to add a tan affinity purification tag to, to the endogenous PSD95, a knock-in strategy, which gave us an extremely good way to purify these complexes very well. And when you do this, as with the other methods, you pull down the key electrical machinery of the postsynaptic terminal, the key glutamate receptors, the potassium channels, and the signaling proteins. So we knew that we were really at the hub of the postsynaptic terminal of excitatory proteins. And we wanted to go outside of those complexes. And Mark Collins, who was a PhD student um, in the lab with Paul Bahusi, started to purify all sorts of other fractions of the synapse proteomes. And then Alex Bayes, um, in subsequent years, came along and did more work. And this is a summary for you now of the postsynaptic terminal of excitatory synapses. And far from just having those few proteins that we thought only a few years before, there's over a thousand proteins in the postsynaptic terminal which are highly evolutionarily conserved across vertebrate species. And there's many different classes of those molecules. And we characterize these in a variety of key um, model organisms um, as well. So why do we have that complexity and what is it actually doing? And another approach was to look at phosphoproteomics. And Mark Collins and Marcelo Kova in the lab did some beautiful work where they could show that when you activate a neurotransmitter receptor, you trigger the phosphorylation on hundreds of sites, on hundreds of proteins. It's extremely complicated molecular computational machinery. And I've told you about the complexes that we had focused our attention on, these PSD95 complexes. But in fact, there are very many more complexes. And Rene Frank has done some wonderful biochemistry here in these blue native page electrophoresis, where all of these bands that you see up here, which are above the monomeric sizes of these pink proteins shown here, all of these are complexes and super complexes. Super complexes are complexes of complexes. And Rene went on to do some very uh, lovely work where he did a genetic dissection of the assembly of these PSD95 super complexes and could show how there are specific genetic rules that orchestrate the hierarchical organization where proteins are assembled not only into these complexes, but there are genetic rules <coughs> controlling their assembly into these super complexes. And these super complexes contain different combinations of those proteins and generate a family of PSD95 super complexes. For those of you who have been paying attention, you will have thought, well, hang on, if there's 100 proteins in a PSD95 super complex and it's one to three megadons in size, surely they don't all fit into the same complex. And they don't. That's because there is a family of them. So, in summary, what I've shown you now is that there was, up until this uh, of proteomics coming in at 2000, we've had a very dramatic expansion in the number of molecules known 
in the synapse. And it was really a very transformative um, set of findings. And it's had a major impact on these areas over here, on disease, evolution, neuroanatomy, circuit function, and behavior. And I'm going to take you through a few examples of that, starting with disease, because I think this is so important and so striking. And the simple fact is that the postsynaptic proteome data sets have been widely used by many groups, not only ourselves, but many, to look at the role of genes in the nervous system. And the simple approach is to simply take the gene uh, the proteome lists, uh, we, which we've made available on our websites, and they've subsequently been used in all sorts of other websites and annotations. And people have used all sorts of genetic approaches to look at that. Now, after we found those three genes back in 2000, we started to annotate the data sets here. And here's some work from my colleague, uh, Douglas Armstrong, um, who we continue to work with, in a paper back in 2005 where we annotated the literature. And at that time, we found that there was as many as 47 genes associated with 183 disorders overall and 54 in the nervous system at that time. It was really quite striking. And I just want to turn to this uh, paper once again, which is the paper where we did the TAC tagging of the PSD95. And we found quite a few schizophrenia susceptibility genes, as many as 28, which we thought was very striking because schizophrenia was known to be a polygenic disorder. The question was, how did those genes work in some concerted way to produce the phenotype that they might produce? And this suggested to us that these complexes could be a point of convergence for many of those schizophrenia genes. Now this was in the era predating genome-wide studies, but I'm pleased to tell you that the genome-wide studies that are subsequently, these are just the ones we've been involved in here, but there have been many others, that show a uh, convergence of schizophrenia genes on those complexes. And over time, as shown here across the years, up to 2014, this is just the increase in the number of diseases that have been associated with these super complexes, so more and more. But I think really a, a, a really striking thing was to move away from the mouse and to study the human. And it was Alex Bayes in my group, a postdoc, who optimized all of the work to work on both fresh and post-mortem material. We did a beautiful study where we systematically analyzed the PSD composition in humans. And we were utterly shocked and surprised and blown away to see that over 130, in this case, Mendelian disorders impact or have mutations that encode postsynaptic proteins. And these turn out to involve many, many rare diseases, but also some common disorders, schizophrenia, depression, autism, intellectual disability, and dementia. And many studies have been showing these associations in recent years, and subsequently in smoking behavior, and in fact, as far as we know, the postsynaptic protein as a set of proteins is disrupted in more brain diseases than any other set of protein that we presently know about. And these are just some of the numbers here. Here's from those super complexes, over 140 disease genes, 200 disorders, and even bigger in the overall postsynaptic protein. So I think there has been a massive impact and importance of that set of molecules. Now I'm going to go back to basic science, and I want to talk about something which I think um, is equally uh, important, which is the spatial organization of the proteome. And I'm going to introduce to you the relationship between the proteome and its complexity to its spatial organization within the synaptome. And as I've already introduced you to, there's this hierarchical assembly from gene expression to the protein and complexes and supercomplexes. But now I'm going to introduce you to the idea that these complexes and supercomplexes are not all the same synapse. They're distributed into different synapses and in fact can generate enormous synapse diversity, which is described in this word, the synaptome, which describes <coughs> molecular diversity and spatial distribution across the brain. So one way to look at the spatial distribution is again to use the um, mass spectrometry proteomic approaches. And in these studies here done by um, Marcia Roy and Oksana Sorokina, we've analyzed different areas of the human neocortex and the mouse neocortex. And in every one of these areas of the brain, there is a differential composition of the postsynaptic protein. We wanted to really get down to the single synapse resolution level. Of course, this clearly suggests to us the possibility that there's different populations of synapses. And we didn't want to do it in an anecdotal kind of way. We wanted to do it systematically. And in this paper that we published last year, we produced the first single synapse resolution of molecular maps across the brain, which described the mouse brain synaptome. And the strategy was simple. Building on our knowledge of these complexes and our ability to genetically manipulate them, we took the PSD95 complexes, which are one and a half megadolphins, and labeled them with EGFT 
And these smaller SAT1 and 2 complexes, labeled in Kusabira orange, so that the mice bred together light up these lovely little multicolored synapses, which you can see contain either uh, or both um, proteins. And if you look at the brain and sections of such mice, you see these exquisite patterns. Uh, and these are not low magnification, these are high magnification pictures, taken at 290 nanometer resolution. And in all of these sections here, we acquire data on in the order of 1 billion individual synapses in each of which we measure protein localization, co-localization, as well as size, shape, and other uh, parameters, and then generate atlases uh, from that information. Now, one of the things we could do with that data was to generate a catalog in an unbiased way of synapse types, excitatory synapse types across the brain. And you can see that you can categorize them into three types, one, those that contain just PSB95, or SAP102, or both, but by the addition of these size and shape parameters, you can get as many as 37 statistically different subtypes. Now, what do they all do? And at the moment, we do not know what they all do, but uh, we, one of the first things we did was to analyze their differential distribution. And this is where you see exquisite differential patterns of distribution of each of these subtypes. For example, here in the hippocampus, here's a subtype that's expressed in the CA1, or enriched in the CA1 that's selected for the CA2, CA3, dentate, and here are some of the gradients from strong to weak, and from weak to strong. If you look here in, this, in these maps of the, of the brain sections here, and these were developed by Ricky Kui, who's a fantastic image analysis expert, working with Fei Zhu, who generated the mice with the Murakami Alpha, and PhD student, Melissa Cicero. And you can see in all of these areas of the brain, beautiful distributions, where we're seeing the dominant subtype in any one, these particular pixels. And you can see that there is differential uh, subunits being dominated in all of these different brain areas. This, I like this map very much here. This is a different kind of map. This is where we're asking how synaptically diverse or complex is each region of the brain. And so you can see, as red being the highest, that in the hippocampus and in regions of the cortex is the highest synapse diversity, whereas these more basal structures have lower diversity perhaps suggesting that these complexity is associated with higher cognitive functions and lower complexity with more elementary behaviors. And we could map this as we did across 800 sub-regions of the brain in all of these subtypes and find that every one of these areas of the brain has a particular composition of these diverse synapses and each subtype has its own differential distribution. And with that, you can start to now look at neuroanatomy in a new way. Namely, you can ask a simple question such as, which parts of the brain are most similar to one another. And that's shown in this correlation matrix here, where all the regions of the brain are correlated with one another uh, along this diagonal. And you see that the extent of correlation is in yellow. And immediately drops out, in addition to all the details of these uh, changes or differences within the cerebrum, there is a big block for the cerebrum, the brain stem, and the cerebellum. Very interesting for us, because that tells us that the patterning of synapse diversity across the brain is a reflection of those three divisions, which correspond very nicely with the three first divisions in the, in the neural tube. In other words, the very earliest embryological patterning is relevant to the synaptone map um, of the brain. Now, of course, you might like to know if the synapse types and their molecular composition is in any way related to the connectivity of the connectome. And we looked at that in a number of ways. And I like this plot here because we're correlating the connectivity between brain regions and our synaptone maps of those regions using data from the Allen Institute here. And there's some very high correlations between the molecular composition of those synapses and their connectivity patterns. And this indicates to us an important concept, namely that it's not just the molecular architecture that builds synapse diversity, but that synapse diversity is in itself programmed in a way that is relevant to the connectivity between all of these different brain regions, something which is now known as the structural not only is there importance for the structural connector, but there's importance for the functional connector. And in these two papers here, we have uh, published data that addresses that issue. For example, um, we have shown that the molecular composition of the regions of the human neocortex are relevant to the task-specific MRI for language and maths and other tasks. And also, uh, the resting state fMRI in the mouse is relevant to the functional uh, structural connector that I've just shown you. So we think, therefore, that there is this architecture that goes from the molecular all the way through to the systems and global level architecture of the brain. 
here for us are some really um, some of the surprises from the synaptome mapping because we had thought that these synapses and the excitatory synapses are kind of the same um, across the brain. But what we're seeing is that they're really highly diverse and that we can generate catalogs, of course. But this diversity is seen on all scales, individual synapses, dendrites, cell types, regions, and global. And that this diversity, as I showed you in some of those beautiful colored maps, and more in the papers if you wish to see them, reveal new regions, boundaries, and gradients between areas of the brain that you can't see by other methods. And finally, that the synaptome really has an architecture which corresponds to the wiring diagram brain. But here is something rather mind-boggling, again, forcing us to think again. And it is that this complexity generates immense synapse diversity. With two proteins I have labeled, I have shown you that we can generate three synapse types and 37 subtypes. If you were to have done the same experiment with 10, you would generate 1,000 synapse types, which could generate 10 to the 11 subtypes. And that's the number of synapses in the mouse brain, and that's only with 10. But I've already told you that this synapse contains the postsynaptic side over a thousand proteins, it's over 200 complexes, and then there's all these other kinds of modifications. So I think it's very, very likely that an animal's brain can only house a tiny, tiny, trivial fraction of the total number of possible synapse types. Now I've told you about the spatial architecture and the molecular principles that organize it that architecture. I want to talk to you now about the temporal organization and ask the question, is, it, is there an architecture across time in the lifespan? And we've addressed this in a couple of different ways. And one of them is to, uh, from some work done by Nathan Skinning, a PhD student at the time, who was interested in gene expression profiles across the lifespan. And he wasn't just interested in the levels of those expressions, but he was interested in when those gene expression trajectories turn which is, of course, indicating a gene regulatory uh, event. And when we classified this data across uh, a couple of hundred mice, across all ages, <coughs> and using publicly available transcriptome data on the human, we predicted algorithms, we generated algorithms that would predict these trajectories, and we asked, could it be useful for measuring the age um, of a RNA sample? And I think these are really remarkable graphs, because if you take an individual RNA sample from either a mouse brain, or a human brain, you can very accurately predict the age of the mouse or the human. Why I think this is so interesting is because it indicates that at every age, your brain is different, and it appears to be changing in a programmed way. And if you read this paper, you'll go on and see that despite the difference in lifespan, about two years versus about eight years, there is the same genetic program going on in both of these species. And what Nathan went on to do was to show that these gene regulatory mechanisms affect different sorts of cell types at different sorts of times, and very importantly, there's a major changes in the young adult brain in synapses, which I'll come back to in just a moment. So that was from the transcriptional point of view. But now I'd like to turn to this synaptome, this extraordinary spatial map of the brain, where we have these diverse synapses organized on the basis of the distribution of proteins and complexes, and ask how does it change um, in across the lifespan. And this is an ongoing project which we're um, analyzing at the moment. And Melissa Ciceron in the lab and Ricky Quig, they have collected and analyzed data across the mouse lifespan at these time points from birth until 18 months. And I'm just going to show you the tiniest <coughs> snippet of that data. And here in the first month of life, these are, sub, these are 37 subtypes in the isocortex. And in the first month of life, there is a very dramatic explosion in synapse diversity that occurs, and then there are changes at other ages. And those changes, by the way, uh, are such that there is, at all ages, your brain is different. And there's quite remarkable changes in some of the parameters. These are density parameters here, but if you just look at these size parameters of PSD95 and SAP102 synapses, you'll notice that the sizes get bigger because smaller synapses are being lost as you get older in the latter phase. And here's one of these correlation matrices. And this, is, I think, is quite a fascinating thing. We're looking at the anatomical correlation here between the similarity of synapses of different parts of the brain across life. And you'll see these between one week and 18 months. Just look at this projection. And initially, there's this big spread indicating that there's a lot of similarity in the brain regions. And as the animal matures to the first two or three months, here you see it gets very much different. And it's very tight and discriminated between the areas. 
little correlations here. But notice now as you get older, it starts to unravel. And we think this is very interesting. In other words, the brain sort of uh, reverts, if you like, to some extent, like its earlier state, or it's losing those specificities of its synapse types in those different areas of the brain. So clearly what we're seeing in both transcriptome and in synaptome data is this remarkable uh, spatial and temporal organization that appears to be programmed across the line. And I want to return to the disease aspect now and ask in what way is this spatial and temporal program relevant to disease? And using our synaptome mapping method, we use, we cross with two different mice, a schizophrenia relevant mouse and an intellectual disability mouse here, and we measure the PSD95 synaptome in these brain sections here. And this is published in the uh, neuron paper. This is Wogan versus Susan. And you can see that these are just measuring the changes between wild type and mutant. And you can see widespread changes and differential effects uh, in parts of the nervous system. Oh, and by the way, for those of you who are interested in finding out which <coughs> part of the brain is messed up in your mutant, this is a fantastic way to do so in an unbiased way. You don't have to have a hypothesis about the amygdala or the prefrontal cortex. You can just go find it with this method in any part of the brain. But the point that I want to make here is that these mutations and other ones that we have measured have very clear and discrete spatial uh, effects on the nervous system. Now, I told you about the trajectory. So here's an example of, in this case, this is work on a postdoc, it's ongoing work by Laura Thomas Roker, where she's used this transcription factor, which, mutant, which causes in humans cognitive defects. And I just want you to look at the synaptome map of these different ages and point out for you that there is a spatiotemporal dynamic to the phenotype, which is related to the trajectory of the synaptome as it changes. So as your synaptome changes with time, the penetrance of the mutation is comes into play. Here's some other temporal uh, data, another line of evidence. I told you about the molecular distributions of parts of the cortex in the differential composition. And what Nathan did in these experiments was to take large uh, smoking GWAS data, and he could show that, or he simply ask the question, if you look at the uh, GWAS data and ask which regions of the brain might it be more likely to impact upon using this proteomic data, it predicts that it's area of Rodman area nine which in fact turns out to be that part of the brain that is discovered in uh, fMRI studies on that, which I think is a very nice way because it links the genome through these proteomic synaptome maps into these brain regional architectures. Here is another one which I'm particularly excited about in the spatiotemporal domain, and it is to come back to schizophrenia yet again, because the hallmark of schizophrenia as a cognitive disorder is its age of onset, which is in, typically in the mid-20s, it's about 26, males, and there is a sex difference where females start a little bit later. And you remember how I talked to you about the transcriptome lifespan calendar as we refer to it in this um, uh, uh, across the lifespan of the human brain. And what um, they had done in this study was to say, well, hang on, are those genes, all of that great big long lists of those genes in schizophrenia, are they regulated in some coordinated way in a way that might be temporally relevant to the age of onset of the disease. Now, I should point it out for you that there's a reason to think there could be the case because the age of onset of schizophrenia is in itself heritable and also occurs across many cultures and environments, suggesting some sort of genetic mechanism. And here's one of the graphs, or some of the graphs from this paper, where what we're looking at here is the age of humans on the x-axis and you look at the area that dips below these red lines, which is significant. And remarkably, for these different sets of schizophrenia genes, and you can see all the different sets and lists of controls that we've performed, that it turns out that they're being regulated precisely on the age, the characteristic age of onset. And moreover, the males precede the female, which is very well described. And also that those sets of susceptibility genes, those postsynaptic proteins, are regulated exactly the same time. So this has led us to this view of schizophrenia, which is that there really the genetic susceptibility of schizophrenia essentially remains silent until young adulthood, when it becomes exposed by the reorganization of gene expression through this genetic lifespan calendar, this program. And so we really think that schizophrenia is caused by mutations or variants that target the expression of synapse proteins in an age window at that time. So there's a variety of pieces of evidence that I think are quite strong that show the spatio-temporal features of this molecular organization are important. But here's one of my favorite hobbies, something for which I have never been able to get a grant, I might add, and it is synapse evolution. 
And it was because we had these proteomic data sets and that it gave us a fantastic opportunity in the area of genomics, which was to simply ask, well, when did all of those proteins first arise and evolve? And how did it ever get to be as complex as it appears to be in the vertebrate organism? And we did many studies on that. And um, this is a summary of some of the key facts that came out of it. As it turns out, this molecular complexity of, which is shared amongst all the vertebrates, it's the same classes and types of proteins that you find in the invertebrate nervous system. There's just fewer of them. But perhaps even more striking is the fact that all of these molecular machinery, including these signaling complexes, are found in unicellular organisms. In fact, all synaptic proteins were invented before the nervous system. They all arose in unicellular organisms, and many of them go back to the earliest prokaryotes, including two component signaling receptor complexes, which are complexes used in bacteria to sense their environment. They give them sophisticated behavioral repertoires. They give them spatial navigation. And it's these same molecular machinery that is doing more or less the same functions in the synapses of higher organisms. This expansion between the invertebrate and the vertebrates occurred in a very short space of time. And at the time we could first describe this, which was in 2008, we didn't know the explanation for why it was that all of these vertebrate species would share this um, complex uh, synaptic machinery, whereas the invertebrates did not. And we reasoned, of course, it must be some, evidence, some, some event that occurred before they radiated from one another. And we now know from a paper that was published in the same year in Nature, um, which is that there were these genome duplications, there was a whole genome duplication, followed by a second whole genome duplication in some of ancestral vertebrate species. And it was remarkable that this species was the one that this organism gave rise to all vertebrates on the planet today. And it was this expansion that contributed to the molecular expansion of the vertebrate synapse. Now, of course, that vertebrate expansion is seen in gene families, such as our favorite PSD95 family. And in invertebrates, for example, there is a single copy of that gene, whereas in vertebrate species, there are essentially four. And they arose from this ancestral duplication, followed by a second duplication. And obviously, the similarity uh, is maintained. And this, of course, as all of you will know, is a very common theme amongst the parallel generation. But why this is so important, I believe, for functions of our nervous system and other complex organisms is that it's those duplication events that now play into this uh, molecular architecture here by multiplying up these components and combinations that can come about to generate more complexes and more synaptome maps. And this is a beautiful example because these maps <coughs> are generated by two parallels from the one gene family, and that's SAP102 and P uh, PSD95 and SAP102. They're parallels of the same family shown here. You can see they're now generating synapse diversity and also differences in complexes. In other words, this molecular evolutionary event generated the vertebrate more complexes, more synapse types, and more synaptome maps. And finally on this theme of evolution, I think this is a fascinating, slightly mind-bending thing, which is that the synaptomes of different species are going to be different, and there's going to be core and conserved synaptomes between these different species there's likely to be potentially species-specific synapse types. And I think that's going to be very important for understanding disease and translation. So much for that. Let's talk finally a bit about synaptome function and really how it works at the physiological level. And I want to lead you into something which we're really very, very interested in at the moment, which is really, I think, kind of potentially a transformative moment for us at least, which is to think that there is a different way about how we think about the brain operating. And I told you about the standard connectionist model, which is that every behavior has its own circuit, and every time you use that behavior, you use that circuit. Well, here is another model, which is not necessarily to the exclusion of that model, but it's a different model altogether, and it has a molecular framework. And it is something we refer to as the synaptome or synaptomic theory. And it's where each behavior is represented in maps of this sort of synapse diversity. Let me explain how it works just from first principles. And I think one of the most important discoveries ever made in the history of neuroscience is this one. And it is that information is encoded in the patterns of nerve cell activity, the all or action potential, described by E.D. Adrian back in 1928. How does the brain read those patterns and make sense out of it and turn on those behaviors when you want them? Well, 
One place that happens is in the postsynaptic side of the psychiatry synapses and involves these PSD95 super complexes. A pattern of activity comes in, an impulse and an action potential generates these postsynaptic outputs, an analog of them, and the amplitude of that response is dependent on the time intervals between those pulses here. So you get these differential patterns that occur. That's well documented. Now think of something a little bit more sophisticated, which is to say, how does it look in three different types of synapses that contain different sets of proteins? And you can see here this pattern of amplitudes is different between these three hypothetical synapses. In a sense, it shows that different synapses are sensitive to different patterns, or different synapses are tuned towards specific patterns. In a simplistic way, you might say this one's tuned to respond preferentially to a one hertz train, or to a two hertz train, or any other configuration of those patterns. Now let's have a look at how that might work in a synaptone map. And I'm just going to put some of these synapse types into a very simple little map like this. And we're going to stimulate all those synapses and see what they do. So here it is. Um, here's our little synaptone map made of these different synapses. And on the first impulse, they're all the same because there's no difference in the basal synaptic strength. The second impulse, which comes along, let's just say it's 20 milliseconds later, because of their molecular compositions, they have a different magnitude of their postsynaptic responses shown in. So you get these differential responses. The, here's another impulse that comes along. And they have another differential response between them, and, as, and so on and so on. And in effect, each one of these responses is an output of that synaptone map. And this tells us two really profound things. That in one map, you can have multiple representations. These are all the representations. And secondly, that the representations can be retrieved in an ordered fashion, in an ordered sequence. So how might that sort of look in a simplistic sort of Way. If an animal has a pattern of activity where it's doing something, like popping it over its, um, uh, its home here, it will trigger these responses in the synaptone map in a spatial fashion. And then when it starts to do another behavior, the same map will generate differential spatial responses in an ordered fashion from those synaptone maps, in effect producing a kind of a mental movie of representations in that part of the brain um, in those maps. Now you're going to say, well, that's sensible, it's very nice, it makes sense, it works, but does it actually happen? And we collaborated with Derek Franzin, who's at the KTH in Stockholm, and these are synaptone maps based upon our synaptone data that's published in the Neuron paper, where we're looking at the uh, different subtypes of synapses in this little block of the hippocampus here, and with these different patterns of activity, the theta bursts and different frequencies here, on the z-axis, we're measuring the amplitude responses. And you can see the spatiotemporal responses of these synaptones is, in fact, different in those patterns of activity. Right, so where does that lead us? This leaves us with the following really simple model about how information is processed by a synapse. Information is written in the proteomes of the diverse synapses. And that information can be read back out again simply by presenting it with a pattern of activity. In other words, information is read or recalled by sequences of activity. This is a very simple recall mechanism. Last year I had the privilege of visiting um, Eric again back at Columbia. We were having a very nice chat in his office. And I said, Eric, I've been thinking, you know, I've been reading all the learning and memory literature for the last 30 years. How does recall work? And Eric goes, I don't know. <laughs> and it is one of those great mysteries. And this is a potentially simple explanation for that. And it is another key aspect to that, because sequences of behavior can therefore be stored and recalled from this really simple me mechanism. Here are some features, and I'm going to finish up. The features of synaptone information processing are that it has a capacity for a vast number of representations of behavioral sequences, and using the same mechanisms to store innate, uh, innate information, programmed by the genome, obviously, in the molecules in the map, and also modification of those proteins can generate learned behavioral representations in the same way. <coughs> Interestingly, this does not require the classic stable change in synaptic strength. I haven't mentioned stable synaptic strength at all. I'll say something about that tomorrow. But it does not require the classical connectionist view of changing the stable synaptic strength. Another distinction between the classical view is that representations could be distributed not restricted to point-to-point -point circuits. 
And finally, genetic mechanisms, mutations and lifespans, such as I've shown you, could change the synaptone and change behavior across the lifespan without actually any physical rewiring of the diagrams. Let me just show you a couple of speculative ideas. Here's a synaptone map, which is programmed to innate molecular composition. And these are what the little pixels represent, these little synapses. And you can see here it's illustrated as a snake. The innate understanding that many organisms appear to have, that they recognize a snake despite the fact they've never even seen them before. And so you can imagine there's ways to simply program behavioral responses by an architecture of synaptone map. And similarly, you could program in, by experience some, something that you may have learned, such as this picture here of the Mona Lisa. But similarly, in the context of the diseases, um, I think it could really help explain some very interesting features. I have shown you this already, which is how mutations change the synaptone map. And I haven't shown you this, but this was, I showed you this part before. This is Eric Franzine's work on a normal mutant mouse and how a representation is generated to these patterns of activity. And here it is in the <coughs> sequence of the mutation. And just compare this one and that one and this pair and this final pair here. And what it shows you is that the mutation, which has now changed the architecture of the synaptone, has changed its ability to generate a behavioral output from the same pattern of stimulation. In other words, the representation is now being uh, has changed or misrepresented, perhaps. And what does we speculate this very nice way here that this is here the normal representation of an image that, if it were, that it was mutated and messed up in some way, and that it's a schizophrenic delusion or hallucination, which might drive one to doing some bad things. So I'm going to wrap up and tell you what I think is the way all of this works. And I think, it, remarkably, that's all incredibly, incredibly simple. And it was that there were molecular machines were invented about three and a half billion years ago. These simple signaling complexes, which are used in these most elementary of organisms for their behavioral response to their environment. And they're capable of generating diverse behavioral records. And really all that's happened is that they have become more elaborate. And by the time at which metazoans formed, and these machines included ion channels and became even more elaborate, they have been simply partitioned into these points of connection between nerve cells. And then they've expanded dramatically to generate these extraordinary synaptone maps. And all of this is controlled, of course, by these genetic mechanisms, some of which I've given you some insight into today. And it is that architecture which is controlled at all points across the lifespan. And it doesn't require much imagination to take that very simple framework and say, well, this is how mutations change it. They degrade or influence that in some way. And it also doesn't take much imagination to say, well, if I have Alzheimer's disease and I degrade the map like this, I could change the ability to retrieve representations or indeed store them. And I think this is a very sim simple kind of molecular architecture uh, view as to how we think about um, molecular basis of behavioral repertoire. Now, obviously, this has taken um, a lot of work. And I'm not going to highlight um, every contribution of all of the individuals involved. I've mentioned many of them here. But again, I want to pay, pay a special uh, tribute to one of my colleagues who started with a postdoc as me, Tommy <coughs> Armour, who's working, he must be now coming on to uh, 20 years, and he now runs his own independent group um, here in Edinburgh. But here's everybody who's uh, can, uh, done that work that I've described today. Thank you very much. cells in which the engram is being stored. One of the um, aspects to that work is they don't really know what are the molecular changes in the cell. 
that are responsible for storing the hidden rand. And in the way I see it, with this, all one has to do is change the molecular composition of those synapses in some fashion, and that could produce the uh, stored information. I think the issue about the relevance of long-term potentiation as the mechanism of storing the engram, as I think you will probably know from the work of Susumu Tanagawa and others, there is a lot of controversy and a lot of work indicating that, in fact, it is not the stable strength that is responsible for storing them the engram. Um, and indeed, I will give a bit of a presentation tomorrow where I will show to you that I think LTP is really a modulatory mechanism and, in fact, potentially plays a very important modulatory role, but it's not necessarily um, the only way, if it is a way at all, of uh, storing information long, long term. So I think this work is very compatible with any of these uh, in grand uh, stories that have presently been uh, presented. Well, can you say this way? Uh, the circuit idea is valid, and their modulation is valid as a mechanism for memory storage, and those memory like the result of some altered synapses. So in other words, those two ideas may not need to be mutually exclusive. No, they don't need to be mutually exclusive, no. I, I, I don't think that there's any reason to suppose that synaptic strength isn't important. In fact, I'm making a key case that it is. It's the dynamic modulation that's particularly important in this setting. Um, I see this uh, framework that I'm putting forward here, the synaptomic model, as a sort of like the next generation beyond this framework, and it, it, it has many features which I think are really very attractive. I just want to return to this just distributed nature. If you go back to the uh, classic work of Lashley, who described the distributed nature of representations in the nervous system, and more recently it has come to the fore by whole organism calcium imaging in zebrafish and in the mouse neocortex, where with very discrete specific types of stimulation, you see very widespread activity across the nervous system. It is not restricted in a highly discrete way to local circuits that are relevant to that. So it would appear then that the nervous system is taking this patterned information and distributing it very widely for whatever the stimulus is. And I would put it to you that when you have these synaptone maps that we have, then those whole maps are reading all of those patterns simultaneously and generating behavioral outputs. And what's very nice about that model, and I think really an important distinction to the connections model, is that it's not that there aren't local circuits or that local circuits are not doing important things. It's just that this allows the whole brain to act in a really quite an integrated kind of way on a very large scale. Okay. Would anybody like to pick a question? Yeah, start there. It's really pretty simple. The, um, I have only simply focused on this postsynaptic side because there's plenty to do here. And I realized all along that the same principles must be applying in those other places. And that would be a good thing for one of the postdocs in my lab to go and do. And, um, but so far, none of them have. Um, but uh, the exactly the same principles apply in these other synapses and on the presynaptic side. In fact, we've done a little bit of work with synaptone mapping on the presynaptic side. And so I think these are quite general to these other subtypes of synapses, and it's a framework that would embrace pre and post. One of the really interesting things about the pre versus post element, which again was in our neuron paper, it goes back to a theory of Sperry's, which is that there is some sort of molecular signals for the connectivity between different cells, and people have spoken quite frequently about combinations of proteins, both pre and post 
And indeed, we do see that, where you can see the sort of synaptome signatures of different synapses um, being relevant to the, not relevant in a functional sense, but indicative of the connectivity diagram. So I think these synaptome maps are a very nice proxy, in a sense, of the uh, structural connectome. Uh, over to Pat, then over to Rob. Yeah? Yeah, very well. Again, a great thing to do. One of the PhD students, Fei Zhu, who did the original work really on the, on the synaptone paper, um, did some work for cultures using alpharescent mice, and they work extremely well for that purpose, but we just haven't you know, had the effort and the time to do that. But I, I think they could do a lot of things with that, for sure. Rob? The way you presented the proteome complexity of the synapse, of the postsynaptic density, um, I think that it'll be stuck in my head that we have we have basically an infinite number of postsynaptic density variants. Right. Um, but, but that's in some you know, discussions with you, there's a, another way to think about it, that the actual computational capacity of any one synapse is now radically different than the just flip-flop switch. Right. And I, I just want you to address that. Either there's a lot of synaptic diversity and it does magic, or a single synapse is capable of a shitload of computation that it wasn't thought to be capable of. I think there's somewhere in between. Um, we think that despite the fact that there is enormous diversity, we don't think, and this is discussions I've had with Eric Franzian about this, there's going to be, there's going to be robustness and redundancy. You don't want to have a rare synapse that's only capable of some rare thing. You want to be able to have redundancy between them uh, and, and function. And then you can, there's all sorts of advantages to having them spatially distributed in a so there's various theoretical reasons why you wouldn't want them all to have super discrete functions. Having said that, um, if you look within one second of action potentials, of which they're separated by 10 milliseconds, not an unusual frequency, 100 hertz, um, you can have 2 to the power of 100, which is 10 to the power of 30 different patterns of activity. Now you can certainly have a very large number of synapses, and I'm not suggesting that every synapse is tuned to one of those 10 to the power of 30 different activity, but I think that the synapse diversity is going to cover a large amount of that space uh, of informational capacity, and it would strike me that in, in, as a, as during evolution that that would have been a very, um, not, I wouldn't like to be a sensible way to uh, design things because it doesn't work like that, of course. It would have been likely that the synapse diversity was being used and not being selected for in some functional setting, so it would make sense that the more subtypes you get, the more <coughs> when it comes down to the individual synapse, I think if you go down to even an individual complex, the computational potential is quite high. When you have an NMDA receptor with a scaffold protein and a voltage-dependent calcium, uh, excuse me, potassium channel, all in the same complex, just those few proteins alone, both control the membrane potential and signaling, and then attach onto a couple of enzymes and other domains, there's many different states of conformation and the signaling potential there. And in each one of those synapses, in a single synapse, you can have over 200,000 individual proteins, several hundred PSD95 supercomplexes and others. So the, the way to mix and match those combinations and their signaling is pretty formidable. I tried to convey in the beginning of this talk, things have happened along the way that have made us have to think again about things. And this is exactly one of the problems that we're having to think about. Because if there is this diversity and diseases change that diversity, which they do, um, how do we reverse that? And I think we need to understand a lot of other really basic things. There's always a need for more basic science. For example, 
what is the contribution of different neuronal cell types to those diversity maps? And there's nice tricky ways to look at that because it may be that in some cases you could stimulate certain cell types to produce certain types of synapses and repopulate or replenish lost synapses. A simple concept that we have seen in many of our models is this, is that there are some synapse subtypes that are resilient to the mutations and other ones that um, are vulnerable. So this concept of the resilient and vulnerable type. So a really simple thing to be doing would be to classify and identify the vulnerable and resilient ones and see then if there's ways to bolster and replenish those resilient ones. And these are obviously just very simple ways of thinking, but you could bring to bear all sorts of very nifty tools these days to set up assays for that, including in vitro assays. Okay, um, looks like the last question comes back. Yeah, it's a really interesting idea, and again, we haven't, at least I haven't, thought it through completely. But I like the idea that in the ancestral organism of the vertebrates, this tree shoe like creature 100 million years ago, that it had its own synaptone map, obviously, and its descendants have um, inherited some of those synaptone maps. And it may be that we have, amongst us and shared with other vertebrates, is some key elements of our synaptone maps that are really conserved between us. And I'm sure that would be the case. And the reason I'm so absolutely sure that is the case is because we have been mapping the human synaptome, and we're going to plan to do a human brain <coughs> synaptome project, which I think will be extremely important. But in our pilot study of 20 brain regions of the human, focusing on PSD95 positive synapses and their distributions and subtypes, uh, we see in anatomical parts of the brain that are homologous between the two species, some very nice correlations between some of the synaptic punctal parameters. So I do think that there are going to be conserved elements between the different species, but I think it's likely, given what we know about gene expression being different between the different species and some of the transcriptome data between mouse and human at the present, where we're seeing different combinations of genes giving different signatures to the same types of neurons, I think that might be reflected in different synapse contribution, synapse composition. So imagine, for example, uh, you know, layer one synapses in the human neocortex they may well have different synapse molecular composition to layer one synapses um, in the mouse. And I think it's going to be really important to uh, understand those differences and study them. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> Don't anybody go anywhere. We have the open, I think, business meeting. Um, and then right after that, we